Hi, everybody. Welcome to Maine Audubon's Climate Spotlight Series. Uh, I'm Nick Lund. I'm Maine Audubon's Network and Outreach Manager, uh, and I want to welcome you to the third in our Climate Spotlight Series, Is Rooftop Solar Right for You? And today we'll be joined by some experts in the field of rooftop solar to share their knowledge and experience with you and to answer any questions you might have. Um, say hello in the chat. Continue to do so, please, as you're joining. Uh, makes a fun atmosphere. So I have to say first, thank you for coming to this main Audubon event. Uh, we've been working hard since 1843 to protect wildlife and wildlife habitat across the state. Uh, if you're not a member, we'd love to have you. And I'll put a link in the chat uh, to our membership, but it's just mainaudubon.org. Um, and at that website, you can also check out our native plant sale, which is happening right now. Um, planting native plants is the best way to support baby birds and pollinators in your area. So uh, check out what's growing at our Falmouth greenhouses and see if you can put some in your garden. Great. Um, so without further ado, uh, we know that making the transition to renewable energy is critical to meeting our emissions reductions goals and combating climate change. And that rooftop solar energy is one of the most effective and user-friendly technologies on the market. Um, today we have three panelists to talk about the nuts and bolts and the benefits of rooftop solar. Um, I'm going to um, start your video, um, Phil, just so we can see you here while I introduce you. There he is. So um, the first on our panel is a co-founder of one of the most exciting and important solar energy companies in Maine, Revision Energy. Um, he's helped install all kinds of solar capacity all over the state. Uh, and it is a great friend of Maine Audubon, uh, Phil Coop. Hi, Phil. Thank you for joining. Um, graciously filling in for Chris Wazaleski from Highland Green uh, is Mr. Christian Haynes. Uh, he is the construction manager at Seacoast Management Company, uh, which has helped install solar panels for residents at Ocean View in Falmouth and Highland Green in Topsom, uh, among other places. Uh, hello, Christian. Thank you for joining. Hi. Last but not least is my colleague, Maine Audubon's Director of Advocacy and Staff Attorney, Eliza Donahue. Uh, she advocates in support of solar energy in Augusta uh, and also know, knows what it's like to be a solar consumer uh, from her home in Brunswick. Hello, Eliza. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Nick. So uh, we're gonna get started in a second. Just a quick uh, tech thing here. Um, all the attendees are on mute. Uh, we can't see you or hear you. Um, if you have, uh, uh, want to type things in the chat. That's great. It's great to hear uh, folks reactions live. Um, if you do have questions, we're going to save the questions for the end. So we have three panelists today. We only have an hour um, and I'm chewing it up right now with my talking. So um, we're going to get through the panelists first and then save questions for the end. Um, so please, the best way to do that is to type them into the little um, Q&A box uh, down along the bottom thing there and we'll answer them at the end. Um, this is being recorded, and so if you miss any portion of it, um, we'll have it on our website um, a little bit later on. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to Phil Coop, uh, and he's going to go. So thank you, Phil. Thanks so much, Nick. Yeah, let me dive right in. I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and try to get through a few um, images here to, to kick things off and also to respect my uh, 20 minute time limit. There we go. I'll assume everybody can see that. So um, since it's such a blazing hot day today, I thought we would start with some, uh, some cooler images. Um, here's our, our new mascot, Sunsquatch, skiing in front of the, uh, the little kids ski shelter at Shawnee Peak up in Bridgefield, Bridgeton, Maine. Um, I want to start with the aperture pretty wide and, and talk about why we so badly need rooftop solar in Maine. Um, we live up in this beautiful little corner of the world where it's, it's not always top of mind that today there are 8 billion people on the planet who are burning fossil fuels for the energy that we need. Uh, this is uh, Mexico City to illustrate kind of the, the sheer volume of humanity today that's burning fossil fuels in a closed atmosphere. And one of the big problems that we face in regard to the, uh, the overall level of um, carbon emissions and methane emissions is that we're fighting this invisible enemy. If, if this is uh, Interstate 295 going north, you know, kind of the, 
the worst problem we might see here is that folks aren't getting to Starbucks as fast as they want to go. But in reality, every car in this image is actually doing this, right? Um, the catalytic converter technology today has rendered carbon emissions basically tasteless, odorless, and colorless. So as a society, we kind of sleepwalk through the truth that um, the, the 500 million cars on the road today are all doing this to the uh, to the biosphere that we depend on for life. And in Maine in particular, we, have four, we also have 400,000 homes that are heated with uh, number two heating oil, each burning about 800 gallons per year and causing about 18,000 pounds of carbon pollution. Again, none of us really see this pollution in the world. So we've got these big invisible problems in front of us. And I just wanna to touch on the, on the um, transportation one more time to note that 50% of the carbon pollution in Maine comes from tailpipe emissions. And at this point, Maine has the highest per capita carbon pollution in New England. So that's just a quick um, tee up for why we really need rooftop solar in Maine. Now let's talk about what is the opportunity for a homeowner to derive a strong economic and environmental return on investment. Well, the first thing that we need is a powerful resource. In this slide, is showing us the relative abundance of energy sources known to humankind. The little blue marble down in the lower left-hand corner, that represents all human energy demand uh, for an entire year. And then you can see in, in this context, we have plenty of finite fossil fuels to meet our energy needs. And we ha have a lot of solar and a lot of wind power to meet our energy needs. The takeaway from this slide is that in one hour, the sun delivers enough energy to the surface of the earth to power all human energy demand for an entire year. So the solar resource is just a staggering amount of uh, power for humankind. And if we get efficient about harnessing it, we can replace those fossil fuels over time. So now let's look at uh, the local solar resource and, and how it is, how abundant it is for Mainers. You can see here from this image that our latitude in Maine is roughly identical to Monaco on the French Riviera. Um, over in Monaco, they enjoy a year-round balmy climate and a lot of sunshine because they don't have the same Gulf Stream weather patterns that bring the Arctic uh, kind of winter weather down through our region. But the bottom line is that this is a very sunny latitude. It's basically the north of France and uh, the north of Spain and the south of France. And you've noticed uh, that you see that I've got Germany circled in the upper right-hand corner. Germany is a very relevant case for us. It's a you know, relatively cool climate, but they've been investing in rooftop solar and renewable energy for about 30 years. And so they really illustrate a pathway to 100% renewables for places like Northern New England over the next 20 to 30 years. And here, here was an announcement back in 2016 where Germany, a modern industrialized nation with a heavy manufacturing economy is achieving nearly 100% renewable energy. And the takeaway from this slide is that at a much further uh, northern latitude, Germany's solar resource is much weaker than ours. In our neck of the woods, we get 30% more sunshine per year than a place like Germany. Um, and you can see the kind of progress that Germany is making. Another way for us to uh, quantify the local solar resource is to look at this nationwide map of solar potential. So what this map is showing us is how much solar electricity we can expect to generate from an array in a given geographic location in the United States. So I've, uh, I've circled uh, kind of uh, New England and then the big star is representing Houston, Texas. It might surprise people to know that a solar array installed in our region is gonna yield about the same annual electricity output as a solar array in Houston, Texas. And that's because we have a good latitude. It's also because solar panels, modern solar electric panels or photovoltaic panels, they perform much better in cooler, drier climates like we have up in, up in Maine relative to the hot and steamy um, type of climate that you have in Houston, Texas. So in a nutshell, Maine has a surprisingly powerful solar resource which actually makes it cost effective to invest in solar technology to harvest that resource. And the other thing I wanted to touch on from the kind of the macro perspective is the cost of the technology. 
Over the past 10 years, the cost of solar electric panels has dropped by more than 80%. And today we're at the point where solar electricity generated from a rooftop array is actually more cost effective than buying electricity generated from a distant uh, fossil fuel plant in our region. So, and you can see from this image, as the cost of solar technology has plummeted over the last 40 to 50 years, um, the resulting adoption of the technology has really skyrocketed. So that's just been incredible. We have witnessed that in ourselves here at Revision Energy. We started out in 2003 um, with basically a couple people in a garage uh, trying to figure out how to do solar. You roll forward to 2020, we've now installed now more than 10,000 solar energy systems in Northern New England. We have about 270 people on our staff. So uh, we're seeing good things happen. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of whether your particular rooftop is good for solar. So you can see from this image where we got to think about uh, the sun on an annual basis, uh, not just what it's like today in the middle of summer, but what also what's it like um, in the dead of winter. And you can see in summer, the solar arc is extremely high. And so um, the, what, what I want to talk about with this slide is the angle of installation that you want to aspire to. And the rule of thumb in solar is you install the panels at the same angle as your latitude. So we're at about 44 degrees north latitude here in northern New England. And so that classic like 12-12 pitch on a northern New England roof is actually ideal for our region. It's about a 45 degree pitch. But it's also important to note that, um, you know, it's kind of like the viable range. You can actually install panels on a flat roof with a slight pitch up to 10 or 15 degrees, all the way up to the 45 to 50 degrees. And you don't lose much production from one extreme to the other. But anyway, the ideal in Maine is somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees as a slope. Um, if you happen to have a 30 degree pitch roof or a 20 degree pitch roof, um, the only thing that happens is that you optimize your roof for solar harvest in the summer with a low pitch roof and you lose some of your solar harvest in the winter um, when the sun is at a much lower angle. Um, the other thing besides thinking about the angle or the slope of your roof is what is the orientation of my roof? A lot of people get hung up on the idea that your roof has to face exactly south to have good solar exposure, and that's actually not true. Um, the aperture for a, a viable solar orientation is somewhere between 150 degrees on the compass, and that's to the southeast, to 240 degrees to the southwest. And you can see from this image that if you, uh, if you happen to have an east-facing roof, and that's the only place to put your panels, well, you're, you're only losing uh, about 23% of your annual yield. So it's not a, it's not a death blow to the solar array. And I've got a, a good image here. Um, thank you, Ocean View in Falmouth. Uh, Christian, I'm sure you recognize uh, this image. This is a, a housing development up in Falmouth where um, the, 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 uh, the founder and developer, John Wasileski, um, has decided that he's gonna have the most sustainable community he can possibly build. And you can see it, almost every home in this development has rooftop solar. And then I've overlaid a compass rose to kind of show us what we can expect. So if you point the solar array due east, you're going to get about a 77% uh, solar fraction as you would if you were to point the, uh, the solar array facing directly uh, true solar south. Um, and just a quick aside, in our region, solar south is actually 196 degrees magnetic on the compass. And to arrive at solar south in a given latitude or region of, of the world, you have to factor in your declination. And that, now getting into the weeds, but our declination here is 16 degrees west. So you take 180 degrees uh, magnetic and you add your declination to arrive at 196 on the compass as absolutely perfect in Maine. Um, anyway, you can see from, from Ocean View and Falmouth that most of these, uh, these arrays are facing in pretty much the ideal direction. You've got one in the lower left that's gonna be a little bit off, but um, the loss per year is pretty minimal as long as you're in the, 
the kind of um, the window from 150 to 240 degrees on the compass. Let's say uh, you live in the most heavily forested state in the nation, that happens to be Maine. Uh, we're still about 90% forested after 150 years of, uh, of heavy timber industry in the Maine, which is pretty remarkable for how we protect our, our forest resources. But you also might have tall trees in front of your roof. And uh, what you're looking at here is an image that's generated by the Sol Metric Sun Eye. This is a really cool device that we bring out when we come and do a solar evaluation at your home. And we can look at the trees on the horizon from your rooftop and calculate with a high level of pre precision how much uh, solar electricity you will uh, for, you know, um, sacrifice by leaving the tree where it is, or maybe you want to prune them back. We can also use this sun eye for a new building lot that's somewhere out in the woods. If we know where your roof is approximately going to be, we'll hop up on a ladder and, um, and use an extension pole to lift the sun eye up to where about the roof plane will be. And then we can do a solar uh, shading analysis from that perspective as well. The bottom line is if you have trees in Maine, um, oftentimes they're not gonna be uh, too thick or tall to prevent a solar installation. Um, and in the case that they are, we have other options that we can, um, we can solve that problem with. But don't worry if you have trees in front, that's, that's something we can deal with. So um, we're talking about whether rooftop solar is right for your home. I just wanna point out, point out on a scorching hot day like today, rooftop solar can be incredibly potent as a, um, as a kind of a greenhouse gas repellent. You can use the solar array on your rooftop to power air source heat pumps um, for heating and cooling. Uh, right now, as I'm sitting here talking to you, my solar powered heat pump is keeping the home at about 70, 70 or 68 degrees and it's extremely comfortable. You can, always, you can also use the rooftop solar array to charge your electric car in the driveway um, you can use it to heat your water with a heat pump water heater, and you can use it, uh, you can store it in a battery for use in the future. And what is really thrilling to, to tell everybody who's uh, on this Zoom with us today is that this 100% solar household idea is really catching hold up here in northern New England. We used to do one or two of these projects per year in our region, and now we're doing one or two projects per week and basically helping people almost completely eliminate fossil fuels with a combination of rooftop solar. Um, the, the little heart there is representing the, the duct work for, for the air source heat pump. You see the electric car in the driveway. And then down here in the basement of this home, there's your Tesla battery to store the, the sunshine on sunny days when you're making more than you can use. Um, you can put the extra into the battery. You also put extra back out onto the grid, uh, which is being shown in this, uh, in this slide, the, the electric poles to the right and the wires are showing how you can export to the grid and get credits for that exported power. Um, in this basement image, I just wanna draw attention to the white box on the wall and on the upper right hand side, that's the solar inverter. And so the rooftop solar electric panels that you see here on the right side, those are solar electric panels. On the left are two solar hot water collectors. But the rooftop solar electric array is generating direct current electricity. And then that direct current flows down into the white box here on the upper right next to the, um, to the gray box. And that inverter, it converts the direct current into alternating current and then that gets fed into the ele main electric panels that you see on the, on the left next to the Tesla battery. And that's just a quick primer on how solar electricity gets harvest harvested on the roof. And then it comes down, it will first feed the loads in your main electric panel. Excess can then be directed into the storage battery and additional excess can then be exported to the grid for credit on your bill. And this is how people, are deriving a really powerful uh, return on their solar investment. You know, you, you generate your rooftop electricity, you remove the need to have uh, expensive electricity coming from the grid, and you can save it for yourself for use at a later time. This next 
uh, image here is just a, an illustration of the different ways that heat pumps can be installed. Um, the above the Amazing Grace uh, uh, poster there, that's a um, indoor unit that blows uh, cold air on a day like today in the summer, and it'll blow out nice hot air in the winter when you need it for heat heating. And the lower right is a kind of a floor register that does the same thing, blows cold in the summer, hot in the winter. This technology, I can't say enough about air source heat pumps powered by solar. It's a zero carbon approach to home heating and cooling. It was not available 10 years ago. Um, today, it is the, one of the fastest growing technologies in the energy sector. And um, it's, uh, one of the reasons is, is that it's about half the cost of oil to heat your home. It's about half the cost of a window air, air conditioning unit for, for cooling. Um, getting back to the nuts and bolts about uh, rooftop solar, um, here's another snowy image to kind of cool us off today. But I wanted to throw this image up. This is a roof that I actually climbed on about 12 years ago when I was a younger guy and, and not so uh, nervous about being up high. Um, you can see that I've got some dimensions around the array. The latest fire codes require that you have a 36 inch walkway on each uh, vertical uh, side of the array and you need an 18 inch clearance between the peak of your roof and the top of your solar array. So those are just some uh, numbers to keep in mind. We handle those for our clients, but if you have a really tight roof space, it can uh, restrict how much solar you can harvest from the roof. I also just wanna draw people's attention to the shadow from the chimney on the array. So that's an example of where we would use that sole metric sun eye tool to, um, to track the shadow. It doesn't matter which day of the year that we're on your roof. When we do the sun eye analysis, it will forecast the sweep of the shadow across the array um, through all you know, 365 days of the year, and then it will spit out exactly how much solar production you will, use, you will lose by having that shadow on your array. Um, the good news is modern solar technology has built-in electronics that can factor in for a shadow coming across like you see here, and it reduces the ne negative impact of of the uh, shadow on your array. 10 years ago, we would not have installed in a situation like this. Um, the good news is that with modern panels and modern uh, solar inverter technology, we're able to solve for a problem like this and still make the investment cost effective. As I get ready to uh, wrap up my 20 minutes, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that Revision Energy is proud to be a certified B Corp. And as a B Corp, um, we've committed to running our business to create maximum positive change in the world rather, rather than just maximizing shareholder returns. We are also a 100% employee owned company because we believe that the people who are making this company succeed deserve to share fully in that success. This is one of our early rooftop solar projects that we did back when Glenn Cummings was president at Goodwill Hinckley School. And um, we were all very proud of how the, uh, the savings for that array were gonna be used to help uh, for uh, scholarships for kids who, um, who really need a lot of help in this world. And so that's pretty much my, my 20 minutes. I can't wait to answer any questions that you folks have. Uh, here is my contact info if anybody would like to reach out uh, via email or cell phone, whenever you wish. And I will stop sharing my screen if I can. Here we go. Thank you, Phil. And, and that I, wraps I don't know it if up. you saw that last slide, but that looks like that was Phil in the set in the Sun Squatch costume. So uh, if you I'm sure you have a bunch of questions about that, how to paddle <laughs> the costume, but um, maybe we can uh, save those for later. So um, thank you so much, Phil. That's fantastic. Um, you guys are are doing awesome work all around the state and uh, and Phil knows all there is to know. So if you guys have questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A box down below. Uh, we'll get to them later. I do see one from Sarah uh, right now about um, what, what solar panels can do when your, uh, your power otherwise goes down, when the grid goes down. Uh, a lot of people lost power in the recent storms. Um, so Phil, do you wanna to speak to that quickly? Before yeah, we let me jump right in. Sarah, that's a great question. Um, you saw that I, I lingered for a little while on that image that had the Tesla battery in the basement. And so 
uh, it's only been within the last three or four years that uh, battery storage technology has reached the point where it's becoming more accessible to homeowners. You can finance the installation of a battery to store solar electricity. When, uh, you know, when the sun is shining and you're making hay, you can store that solar electricity in your, in your on-site battery. And then when the grid goes down or the sun isn't shining at night, you can fall back to the battery as kind of like your backup power supply. Um, and as time goes by, the cost of batteries continues to decrease. Um, and we will also eventually be able to use our electric car in the driveway as a backup battery for the home when the grid goes out. So um, keep your eye on battery storage. That is the solution to the, to the problem we drew, we drew our attention to. Fantastic. Thanks, Phil. I see some other questions coming in, but we are going to save them uh, and move on to uh, Mr. Christian Haynes. Uh, you saw a, a, an image there of Ocean View in Falmouth. Uh, he, uh, he was involved with that, I believe. So, uh, Christian, uh, take it away. Uh, thanks, Nick. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon. I guess we're, we're right on the border there on the cusp of that. So, um, I'm just joining in to, I guess, maybe talk about um, our experiences as a uh, community developers and um, our initiative as a corporation or as a, as a developer. Um, and it all comes from the top. Um, and Phil mentioned John Wazaleski, our owner, um, who oversees and owns several retirement and age uh, adult community communities throughout the state. Um, so John started probably, I would say, oh, a good 10 plus years ago with Revision Energy. Um, with some of our uh, existing buildings here in Falmouth um, and worked with Revision to put together some plans to start to install, uh, I think originally on uh, some of our earlier projects were actually solar hot water projects. Um, and then those morphed into more of a PV um, electric style systems on, on some of our existing buildings, um, both here in Falmouth and in uh, Topsom at Highland Green. Um, over the last several years, and then recently, with uh, we've we've kind of involved um, solar right from the get-go on all of our new um, projects, and so that really started um, primarily in Falmouth here uh, with our Blueberry Commons uh, project, and that was built right into the build the, the project right from the get-go, and then it that morphed and flowed right into um, our project uh, the com um, uh, schoolhouse cottages here in Falmouth, which Phil showed you a picture of. And we did, we built 48 um, independent uh, buildings and cottages for residents. And uh, all 48 cottages have its own uh, grid tied solar system, um, which the, the residents love because obviously it helps with their electric bills significantly. Um, Plus, it's the owner's initiative to do what he can to, to, to reduce his footprint. Um, so we have uh, also uh, done some other larger projects where we, it's just part of the, right out of the get-go, how are we going to involve solar and revision to, to help this uh, project work? And so in our um, Lunt professional building here in Falmouth, we installed solar when we added on to that with our um, uh, memory loss care building. And so we also incorporated a, a, a electric car charger out in the parking lot for folks who are visiting um, relatives or doing business in our lump professional building. So we, we're, we're trying to do a little bit of, of everything. Um, uh, we've started a new community over in Cumberland, Cumberland Crossing. And we, again, on every cottage, uh, we are installing a solar system. And Phil touched upon the, the cost for, for solar, and we've actually benefited greatly from that. Um, going from Falmouth to Cumberland in just those, I'd, I'd say, the last three or four years, for a generally about the same cost of the systems that we were putting on in Falmouth, now we're, we're, we're carrying the same expense, but we're actually able to put a little bit larger array on the roof. Um, obviously, so that's generating more solar power uh, per building. And, um, it, but, but the, expen the expenditure 
um, has not risen ex uh, exponentially. It's been it's almost been a, a, the same cost, which has been fantastic. And and obviously, revision you know crunches the numbers for us and tells us the best uh, avenue to go to to maximize the the benefit to the dollar. Um, and so they're they're very helpful with that. So in our community up at Highland Green, um, it, we've seen a, a, a great increase in participation in solar early on when the when the Highland Green started several years ago. Um, it was probably I would say I, it was right around the 15 to 16 percent of folks who were building new homes up there were considering solar and 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 actually you know followed through with some type of solar system on their homes in Highland Green and now um, in the last oh three to five years uh, we have seen an increase of probably more around the 60 percent um, follow through with people who have inquired about solar and have followed through with solar on their homes um, which is which is great to see Several people in Highland Green actually have done um, kind of what, what Phil was alluding to is um, they have gone to heat pumps with solar uh, PV and hot water and um, they, are, they are very much self-sufficient. Um, however, they are still grid tied, um, but their homes are extremely efficient um, and, and they love their homes. They, they, they rave about them. They love to have people come in and see what they've done. Um, and so that, that's exciting to see as well. And we, we continue to, to talk to people about solar and the positive uh, benefits, um, not only for um, their day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month, uh, billing, but also the, the great things that it's doing for the environment. Um, so we, we, we are launching a new cottage product in Highland Green as well, called the Quarry Cottages. Um, these will be, um, homes that people can select a site and, and build a, um, a nice 1600 square foot cottage on there. Um, we will have as part of the build package, uh, a, an option to add uh, a solar package. It will be up to the new resident, whether they choose to um, move forward with that. Um, but these folks these days are very much um, in tune to what solar is all about. They've learned a lot about it through, through neighbors, through, webinars like this. And so a lot of people like to know more about it and ask about it and realize that it's a great benefit. Um, in, our, in our projects in Falmouth and Cumberland, um, the developer has, it is part of the build cost. Um, it, that's, it's not an option there. Uh, we just include it as, as the right thing to do. Um, I believe, and, and Phil might be able to, to help me on this, but um, in Falmouth, I believe we are generating up over a megawatt of energy, um, and we hope to continue to increase that ability throughout all of our campuses to, um, to generate a, a good quantity of electricity to be able to sh be shared um, throughout the community. Um, we also are approved and working on um, trying to come up with some, entice some investors for a solar farm in, at uh, Highland Green. Um, so that's an ongoing project as well. Um, and we hope to maybe someday uh, the community center up at Highland Green, if we um, were to do an expansion or a renovation on that building, we would certainly probably entertain um, adding solar as well to, to that project. As again, the owner likes to, um, you know, anytime we do a project or we do a renovation, we, we try to, include the solar into the base cost of the project um, just as kind of the right thing to do. I uh, also want to mention that we just recently installed a Tesla power wall in one of our cottages in Cumberland um, and we are very excited to learn more about that, how that works and um, see the effects of having that um, tied with the solar system in the home there and see what Hopefully the, the new residents who move into that unit um, eventually, that's our model unit right now, will, um, will really take advantage of that and enjoy that as well. Um, it is, I can talk quickly about, about kind of the, the construction end of things and, and Phil kind of uh, touched upon some of that, but I will say that um, new construction, if you're, if you're planning or thinking about building a new home, uh, installing the solar is extremely simple. 
Um, it, it's uh, it's they're in and out. They'll rough things in, and in, in usually uh, not even a day. Uh, the panels go on the roof, you know, half a day, um, and it's uh, they're they're very efficient. They're very good at what they do, and uh, as well as probably other solar companies. Um, for a retrofit for an existing building, um, again, a little trickier, um, but you know everybody kind of puts their heads together and figures out the best way, simplest way to get from point A to point B, which would be you know the, the panels on the roof to a mechanical or a basement area to set up the, the basically the infrastructure, the inverters and the tie-ins to the panels and, and all of that, those good things that go along with the, with the solar. But um, we have been extremely um, satisfied with, with everything that we've been doing and feel it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to do for our communities um, throughout the state. And um, we hope to continue to um, try to lead the charge on um, on, uh, on on in incorporating uh, solar with with all projects that we uh, that we are considering and working on. So I think right. that's about that's about all I have. Christian, thank you so much, and thank you for all the work you're all doing across the state in all your facilities. Um, it's really exciting, and I know that a lot of your residents. Uh, appreciate it and are um, happy to be on the cutting edge and cutting down their footprint. Um, I, I should also note, uh, Christian mentioned a uh, solar farm there quickly. If you'd like more information on community solar, um, please check out uh, the video on mainonabon.org uh, of our previous um, Climate Spotlight uh, presentation all about community solar. Um, I'll link to that uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, thank you, Christian. Uh, again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box down below. Um, uh, I see Phil is hard at work answering them already. Uh, he, he, he knows what he's doing down there, but we'll get some for the end as well. Um, and I want to turn it over to my colleague, Eliza Donahue, um, Maine Audubon's Director of Advocacy and Staff Attorney, to talk about her work with solar and her personal experience uh, at her home with solar panels. Eliza. Great. Thanks, Nick. Good morning, everybody. Um, so again, Eliza Donahue, I'm Director of Advocacy at Audubon, uh, and I'm here to share my experience as a homeowner with solar uh, on their roof. My plan is to share the basics, you know, how my family and I made the choice to invest in solar and how it shows up in our day-to-day -day lives from our electricity bill to what's in our basement and, you know, what happens when it snows, though, uh, though others have already gotten there, I suppose. Uh, so my husband and I built our home in Brunswick in the summer and fall of 2016. Uh, we opted for new construction because energy efficiency and heating and powering our home with renewable energy was our number one priority. We knew that we wanted to heat and cool our home with heat pumps and that we wanted to feed those pumps with solar energy. Uh, homes with that combination of heat pumps and solar were not widely available and retrofitting an existing home more on the heat pump end of things didn't really appear to be within our budget. So when we met with solar installers, we really only had cost in mind. Uh, working in environmental advocacy, I didn't need to be convinced that avoiding fossil fuels was a good thing to do. Uh, and I also knew a handful of folks in Maine who had had a positive experience installing solar on their homes. But we were on a budget. Uh, it needed to make economic sense. Uh, and the funny math that we worked off was this, you know, how this is the way that we kind of figured out whether this made sense for our wallets. We rolled the cost of installing the heat pumps into our mortgage. And we, so we set that aside. And the cost of financing the solar panels, um, because we didn't have the cash to pay for them outright, and what we paid or what we anticipated we would pay, if anything, to our electric utility needed in our brains to be comparable or less than what we had paid in the past annually for heating with oil and, um, and paying an electric bill. That was about, or had been about $3,500 annually. So again, that's kind of funny math because we did not incorporate the cost of the heat pump system, which was considerable, 
Um, again, our entire home is heated with heat pumps, nor did we account for the return on investment on the heat pumps or solar panels, which was substantial, substantial in a really positive way. The installers that we talked to really took the time to lay out the costs. We really belabored it and they were right there with us uh, down to the nitpicky details. We ended up installing, and here I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen. Let's see how this goes. All right, I think I'm good. We ended up installing uh, 21 panels uh, on the roof of our new home. Uh, the installer even helped us identify what solar self was. So we made sure that our um, home was oriented to maximize our solar gain. And you guys already got some great information from Phil that sure, if you can have your home um, face solar self, that's great. But just because it doesn't, doesn't mean that solar isn't a good fit for you. Uh, the total cost of the project was about $20,000. $20, um, that was before the federal tax credit. So that remember, this is back in 2016. Um, the federal tax credit was 30% then. Uh, today, that federal tax credit is 26%. Our panels generate the equivalent of about 90% of the electricity we consume. We generate excess electricity in the spring and summer months. And because our panels are grid tied and due to Maine's net metering law, we draw on that excess in the fall and winter. So come February or March, uh, our consumption exceeds a combination of the energy we're generating and our baked banked credits. We end up paying in February amount or March about $150 a month to CMP to cover um, those electricity costs. Then back in the spring or when we get back to spring, our energy needs uh, go down again and our solar gain goes up. So factoring that in, uh, again about $350 annually that we pay to CMP and then about uh, $2,200 annually that we pay to um, that we use to pay for the panels themselves, that was well below what we had been paying or what we would have paid had we um, installed you know, traditional oil heating in our home. So the cost was, was well within our budget. Now today, four years later, um, and even you know, immediately after uh, we installed the uh, the solar panels, we really don't interact with them at all on a day-to-day -day basis. There is an inverter in our basement that literally only has an on and off switch and it's always on. I'm going to share a copy that hopefully is appropriately redacted on my most recent CMP bill. Yep, here it is. Uh, you'll see that, um, and this is literally my most recent bill, uh, that all we're paying for this uh, $13 are delivery charges. I'll move over to, let's see this one. Here is also a picture from my most recent bill. Uh, it is, and you'll see that there is a chart of my generation and usage over the course of a year. Again, generation far exceeds usage about half of the year, um, is very similar a couple um, of other months in the year, and then I draw on banked credits during the winter months. And what's notable about those winter months is that I'm still generating power then. Um, snow sticks to the panels, but generally by mid-morning, it falls off on its own. I've never had to, nor is it probably a good idea given the design of my house to knock snow off. The panels uh, heat up enough that the snow slides off very easily. So I think given the time, uh, I'm going to leave it at there, but I'll, I'll say that I'm, I'm really stoked about my solar panels and have no regrets. You know, obviously everyone's situation is different, but 
based on my experience, I have a lot of confidence that installers can help walk anyone through designing and paying for a system that meets your needs. Actually, just last week, um, I went through the process again. We're looking to build an addition, a garage, and we want to make sure that when we're designing that garage, that it is designed um, to anticipate our electricity needs, including um, getting electric vehicles in the future. You know, what is it going to need? How many panels are we going to need to install? Um, should we, uh, you know, a couple years, a handful of years down the road, um, purchase electric vehicles. The installer helped me make really educated guesses at future consumption and associated costs. Um, and even what it would mean if we designed a garage with an east facing roof. Um, and if you remember back to, to Phil's presentation, uh, you know, sure, solar self is great, um, but there is a lot that can be done with roofs that um, might not be, you know, perfect. So that's me and I'll uh, pass it back to you, Nick, to do some Q&A. Hey, everybody. Uh, Eliza, thank you so much. That is great on the ground experience. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, hope that all the panelists want to start their video again. Um, and we have a few questions. Please, folks, uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I actually want to start with a question of my own, uh, and I'm the host, so I can do whatever I want, um, which is, you know, very basically, if I want to start the process of putting or considering putting panels on my house, what's the first step? Uh, and maybe the second and third steps. Um, and I don't know if uh, Phil or uh, Eliza or folks who have experienced it. So under, uh, under COVID, Nick, we've really had to change our procedures uh, for, you know, for more than three months, we were excluded from visiting people's homes. And so we were doing virtual solar evaluations, which is a, a service that we still offer. And we do this via a similar kind of a Zoom meeting where we get on line with the client, we can look at your roof with the excellent Google map imagery that's available mm -hmm. today. And with a very high level of accuracy, we can calculate the orientation of your roof. We can figure out the pitch of your roof and we can give you a pretty good preliminary snapshot of a solar return on investment um, remotely um, online. And if you like uh, having visitors come to the house, we also do the in-person solar evaluation at your home. Um, and we'll come out and do all of the hands-on measurements and, and use that SunEye tool to calculate any potential shading issues. But anybody on this uh, Zoom today can simply go online and go to Google Maps and look up their address and use the satellite view and the compass rose that's on Google Maps to get a good sense of what your orientation looks like. Hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, so I'm diving into some questions from the Q&A. Um, Allison Saunders asks, we have a metal roof. Does that create any issues? Um, a standing seam metal roof is actually the very best surface on which to attach an array because we can clamp to the standing seams and avoid have, having to do any uh, roof penetrations whatsoever. Um, that being said, the vast majority of our projects are installed on asphalt roofs and and so we're, we're very good at both but if you've got a metal roof you're actually in in ideal shape for a solar array great um arnold asks uh where the panels are manufactured so uh, modern solar electric panels or photovoltaic panels are a global commodity they're manufactured in the u.s and pretty much on every other continent um, around the globe we uh, intentionally try to source as much as we can locally, although the, uh, the US made product today is one of the more expensive panels that's on the market. Um, we also offer people panels sor sourced from Western Europe. Uh, Germany is one area where we get our panels. And then the balance comes from uh, Asia, excluding China. Um, we, we consciously tried to not source from China because we think um, it's not the best place to buy our products from. But uh, also now we have some pretty stiff uh, tariffs on solar panels coming out of China. And so 
we do source from places like Taiwan and the Philippines. And we like to give consumers a choice in where ultimately they get their solar panels. Great. Um, so Phil was busy answering some questions in the q and I'm not sure if everyone was able to see those answers or not. So apologies if I cover some of the same ground. But um, Ernie asked a couple questions, um, one of which Eliza touched on a bit, uh, which is what is the expected uh, lifetime of solar panels and what happens when snow and ice um, builds up or covers them? Sure. So, uh, you know, modern solar technology is incredibly robust and re reliable. Um, all of the tier one products, which is the only type of equipment that we install, um, those solar panels come with a 25 year warranty and a 40 year expected useful lifespan. And, um, you know, we can say that with a, with a straight face when you think about the fact that solar panels today are what um, human life is depending on for survival at the space station in outer space. And outer space is one of the harshest environments known to humankind. And so if solar panels can uh, do a great job in outer space, you can start to have a, a little bit of confidence in a 25 year terrestrial warranty like you get here on, on planet Earth. Uh, we've got um, hundreds of thousands of panels installed throughout Northern New England today. And the failure rate of those panels is, is below like 0.2%. It's a uh, astronomically low number. And one of the reasons these systems are so reliable is that you have zero moving parts in a solar electric system. So there's virtually no failure points. Um, and with regard to snow and ice, you know, yeah, the reality is we, we live in northern New England and we get some pretty harsh winter weather. And you can get a mix of, um, you know, heavy wet snow followed by a really hard freeze. And under those circumstances, your solar panels will become covered in a bulletproof uh, shell of, of ice and snow. And during those stretches, which typically number a few days or maybe a week, you're probably going to have zero production from the solar array. Um, when we do a, a preliminary um, estimate for a customer like yourself, Nick, you were wondering how it might work for you. When we tell you about your solar array and what you expect to receive in terms of annual generation, we include a couple weeks of zero production in the dead of winter because we know it's likely that you're going to be uh, you're going to be covered by a nor'easter for a few days, if not a full week, and that gets factored into the factored into the production estimate. And it's also worth noting that with more than 10,000 arrays installed thus far over the last 16 years, we have this great body of data about what a solar array will yield will yield because each array has this monitoring system and it shows you day by day production. And so we have a historical look back on the output of all the arrays we've installed thus far. And that enables us to highly, uh, be highly accurate when we forecast what an array will, will generate when we install it for you at your home. Great, thank you. Um, Julia Johnson asks, can solar be used for radiant floor heating? Yes, uh, really good question. So that depends almost 100% on the quality of the structure. And so if you want to have solar powered radiant floor heating, you have to build a high performance envelope for your building, whether it's a, you know, a passive house kind of uh, home build where you've got minimum R40 insulation in the walls, R60 in the ceilings. You really need a super insulated envelope to enable solar powered um, radiant floor heating to succeed. Because you got to remember the time when you most want the heat, say in January and February, it coincides when the solar resource is at its absolute lowest in Maine. And so to be able to use that, that minimal solar resource to provide heat in the home, it's got to be super insulated. Great. Um, a question from CM Pyle. Uh, could you speak to the differences between summer and year round homes? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, solar electricity produces typically 12 months of the year with, with minimal output in January and February. Um, if, if you're putting a solar array on your summer home, but won't be living there in the winter, um, you may be able to, um, harvest solar energy credits for the time of year when you're not using the property. And 
um, I think, you know, it really depends on the situation. I think this type of question would actually be better answered offline because it varies from state to state depending on what the policy is. And it also depend, it depends on, you know, are you there six months a year? Are you there three months of the year? Um, and so it's very, it's highly specific to the usage and where the, the home is located. Great. Um, question from me. Um, Eliza mentioned that the um, tax credits uh, are in fluctuating or changing a little bit. Is there um, an outlook in that uh, realm or do we know what the future looks like for solar credits? Yeah, so right now a homeowner stands to receive a 26% federal tax credit on a solar installation that's completed in 2020. And I'll just say that right now um, a lot of the solar companies in Maine are getting fully booked for the installation queue for the rest of the year. And so at Revision, one of the things we're doing is we're guaranteeing people the 4% um, difference in the tax credit change that will happen on December 31st. So in 2020, the tax credit is 26%. In 2021, the tax credit steps down to 22%. Um, so this year is better than next year in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the solar return on investment. And for folks who don't, um, who don't make the cut in our installation queue, we're guaranteeing that 4% benefit into 2021 if you install in the first quarter. Um, yeah, and then it's really important to note that in 2022, the tax credit goes down to 10% for commercial projects and goes mm -hmm. to zero for residential. Wow. So, so we are uh, crossing our fingers that we get a change in the federal leadership in November which will hopefully lead to some type of restoration of the tax credit in the years ahead. And this folks is why they call it the solar coaster. <laughs> and folks, please join uh, Maine Audubon's advocacy alerts if you wanna help encourage um, uh, beneficial solar policies from state and feds in the future. Um, question from Sandy, um, can solar be used on a mobile home? It can be. Um, I, I guess it depends on how mobile the home is, right? I mean, a lot of mobile homes uh, sit in one place 12 months of the year, and that makes it pretty simple to do a solar array because that, that mobile home is probably connected to the grid, and you can do a grid-tied you know, PV system. If the mobile home is truly mobile and you're trying to drive it all over the place, that's an entirely different animal. Um, and in that case, you're using a, you know, a solar array that's connected to a, uh, an inverter and a battery system exclusively. That's called an off-grid system. Um, we can help people with both options, uh, but the bulk of our work is done for homes that stay in one place year round. And for folks who want something smaller that's off-grid, I've, I've put into the Q&A, a reference to a place called the Alt E Store. It's www.altestore.com, and that that business sells people uh, small solar plus battery packages to like to power your camp in the summer, or maybe to power your mobile home if you're moving all over the place throughout the year. Great. And with that, we are at the one hour mark, and I think we're going to stop it here. Um, if you have additional questions, please uh, email me if you'd like, which is nlund at mainaudubon.org. Uh, and Phil's email as well was, could you say that one more time, Phil? Phil at revisionenergy.com. There you go. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, Phil Coop. Christian Haynes, Eliza Donahue. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and joining us today. I hope you're staying cool out there, hopefully from a cooling heat pump. Um, if you uh, wanna watch any, that's right, <laughs> Eliza is nice and cool right now. Uh, if you, uh, I will put this up on uh, Maine Audubon's website as soon as I can. So if you missed anything, feel free to check that out. Uh, thank you so much for joining Maine Audubon. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>